Check, check, check. So to mute it, you just have to then you tap it again and make it.
Good morning. Welcome to each of you to our adult forum here at Calvary. And uh, I want to welcome our live stream audience as well. And we're honored today to have back with us Dr. Mitzi Minor, uh, the Mary Magdalene Professor of New Testament at Memphis Theological Seminary, beloved teacher and biblical scholar. And Mitzi joined the MTS faculty in the summer of 1993. From the beginning of her vocation as a teacher scholar, first as a grad student, through three years of teaching undergrads and during all her time at MTS, the primary focus of her work has been and continues to be the intersection of the New Testament with her own spiritual journeys. She believes deeply that critical Bible study is significant aid along the journey and seeks to demonstrate that belief in the classroom and in the church and when she writes. And uh, Dr. Minor, like me and like probably some of you, was reared in Southern Baptist churches. She continues to be grateful for those uh, good folks in that setting who taught her to love the Bible as a child. And uh, if possible, uh, she would love to spend every moment outside of work, hiking somewhere, taking her camera along. But since that's not possible, she also fills her non-working hours with good friends, mystery novels and poetry, bicycle rides, being an Auburn sports fan, we won't hold that against her, <laughs> and attending her large and close, attending uh, to her large and close extended family. She's here today to begin a two-part series uh, asking this poignant question, if Jesus' resurrection is possible, then what else might be possible? Please welcome Mitzi Minor. What do you do with it when you take it off? <laughs> I don't know about y'all that like to do that with them, right? Um, boy, it's good to see you. Um, this is the first time I'm in person uh, back with folks on Sunday morning since the pandemic. And I'm, uh, <laughs> me, yeah, I'm, I am. <laughs> Uh, I'm really, really delighted to be here. I was, I was telling um, Paul and Scott uh, when I got in the car this morning, pulled out of my parking, my garage. I live in Cooper Young, and I started down the road. I thought, now how do I get to Calvary? <laughs> because it's been so long. So uh, I am, I'm really, really glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Hello to everybody on, uh, on in your live stream as well. Um, and I'm particularly glad to have an opportunity to talk about uh, resurrection. Uh, let me start with two stories that, um, that I really love and that are going to sort of shape how we go about um, uh, dealing with resurrection for this Sunday and next. So the first is uh, by writer Nora Gallagher, who had the opportunity, this has been a bunch of years ago, uh, to be uh, at the National Cathedral for Christmas Eve services. That's on my bucket list. But um, So she was there, and, and she, I don't think she says who the um, priest preacher was that evening but he started his sermon and that it was going to be about what I really want for Christmas and it just made her mad she thought how many freaking sermons have I heard about you know that that deal with something like that and she got up to leave and and her she was with a friend who you know sit down we don't leave in the middle of the sermon at the National Cathedral on Christmas Eve you know kind of thing but when she was talking with her friend later, you know, again, just really frustrated with what she considered to be a pretty bland, you know, approach to what should be a marvelous occasion. And she said, because what I really want for Christmas is to believe in the resurrection. And so that story has stuck with me all these years. Okay? So that's the first one. Here's the second one. Theologian Dorothy Zerla, um, was a German theologian who was teaching at Union Seminary in New York, she's gone on now to the church triumphant but in those years prob this was probably in the 80s she was teaching union seminary in new york and you know spring rolls around and easter preparations are happening and she gets the uh expected phone call from a reporter wanting to talk to her about whether or not the resurrection really happened you know so somebody from the new york times you know and they always have to do with something like that you know um uh, come, you know, come Easter season. So this particular time, the guy calls and says to her, so did the resurrection really happen? And she said, that's the wrong question. And, you know, of course, he said, well, what's the right question? And her answer was, if it did, 
what difference does it make? So those two questions are going to sort of, or, or those two stories with those kind of questions, the second one surely a question, are going to sort of shape how I approach um, resurrection these next Sunday, today and next Sunday. I'm going to look with us in scripture for responses to these particular settings. Today, what I'm going to do is lay some foundation for how we deal with both of those circumstances. And then next week, we'll talk about actual responses. Okay? So just to give you an idea where we're going. Um, I'm going to clear my throat now, which is I have spring allergies. You know, they haven't gone away with COVID, right? So, <clears throat> but these days, if you cough or anything, you know, you have, you have to be kind of careful with that. So I'm going to start with a history lesson. Some of you, I hope your eyes are not glazing over. Um, some of you will know that I am big on context. You know, the, the, the context matters. You know, where a, a story, a teaching, um, a prophetic text comes from really matters. And so we're going to talk a bit uh, about history to set up where we're going. And some of you may be surprised to learn that for much of the history of ancient Judaism, notice the ancient part of that, there was actually no explicit hope for resurrection. Um, you know, you and I, particularly those of you who've grown up in church, and that's probably most of us, have just grown up with this idea ingrained in us. This is how we think about life and death. That wasn't always true. In ancient Judaism, for most of ancient Judaism, there was no explicit hope of resurrection. Life was now, and even reward and punishment, the idea of, of God's blessings, for example, were all about this life. And the teaching overall was, if you keep the covenant that we have made with God, then you will be blessed. And if you don't keep covenant, you'll be cursed. And that happens in this life. If any of you uh, want to take a look at it, Deuteronomy 28, for example, 28, I think maybe 28 to 30, are, uh, it's a really good place to see where this is sort of laid out explicitly. Uh, by the way, guess which there are more of, blessings or curses? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> I don't know why, yes, exactly, I heard somebody say curses. So I don't know why that is, but, um, but that's there. And for most of ancient Jewish history, that's how they thought about life. There developed at some point along the way this idea of, and you may have seen it, those of you who are readers in the Psalms may have come across this idea of Sheol. Have you all seen that sometime? And have you ever saw that and thought, what the heck? Right? And that developed sort of this idea it was the place of the dead. And, and the dead ones were there and were kind of, sort of, maybe a little bit still present, but not exactly. Doesn't that sound like a place you want to go, all right? And in, and in fact, the psalmist used that idea to sort of bargain with God. You know, I, you know, I, I can't praise you anymore if, you, if I go to Sheol, so don't you want to keep me alive so I can, you know, continue to praise you and speak of your wonders, you know, some of the psalmists would do that. So there developed this idea of Sheol, but, but that was kind of it. Now that doesn't mean that, that these people didn't hope that there was something beyond death. You know, you almost can't not hope that. But in terms of their explicit understanding, okay, you know, that was where they were. And what changed uh, it was about the year, well not a year, I'm not going to give you a year, about the early part of the second century B.C., so you know the time I'm talking about, right? So second century before Jesus comes onto the scene, okay? And Israel was once again um, somebody's subject peoples, you know, they kind of took turns, you know, being conquered by, you know, you know, there needs to be a bumper sticker, you know, right? Honk if you once had Israel as part of your empire, right? You know, so the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and, and probably some others in there, you know, that were, didn't last very long. And now it was the Syrians. And a guy uh, usurped the Syrian throne, which is 
about the only time I ever get to use the word usurp, and I, it's, a, it's a really cool word, so, <laughs> so I use it, it essentially stole the Syrian throne uh, and made himself the new ruler in, in this particular empire. His name was Antiochus. He took also the name Epiphanes, which you may think that sounds kind of like Epiphany, like Epiphany Sunday, and you're right. And that word, if you don't know, literally means the appearance of a god. So friends, that's what we call a clue as to the character of this person, right? So what he really wanted to be was Alexander the Great 2.0. That's what he really wanted to be. Um, he he and, and Israel, the Israelites were never friends. Uh, I don't know if he had friends, but there you go, right? So at one point when they're their being his subjects got really tense. He cracked down on them, and one of the ways that he did was he forbade the practice of Judaism under pain of death. So no circumcising their sons, no Sabbath observance, no teaching Torah to your children, you know, all of those things that made Jewish life Jewish life, they couldn't do. And this creates what amounts to a spiritual crisis for Israelite people, and here's why. I just told you that their dominant theology had been that reward and punishment happened in this life. If you keep covenant, you'll be blessed. But under Antiochus, if they kept covenant, they might die and, and, and certainly face the risk of persecution, arrest, being thrown into one of the prisons and doesn't that sound like something you want to do? you know, with a significant portion of your life in that world. And so their theology and their lives weren't fitting together anymore. And some of you have experienced that yourselves, um, personally. And when that happens, it really does create a spiritual crisis. In this instance, it was not for an individual on his or her journey, but for a group of people and how they understood themselves and their relationship with God. And out of this tension, <clears throat> out of this sense of crisis, the people within Israel who were good at doing significant thinking and reflecting and took a look at their history and their understanding of God and what was happening and, and asked themselves, what have we missed here? And what they concluded that they had missed, that they had not taken into account as they were doing their theological understanding was the very real presence of evil in the world. That God may indeed long to bless those who keep covenant, but if evil is present in the world, and Antiochus made it real clear that it was, that gets disrupted. Uh, that gets knocked sideways. And so they backed up and they thought, how do we think about this then? And they, again, reflected on their history and, and how far God had brought them. And they noted that in all this time that they had, had affirmed out loud that God was the creator of all that exists. And that God's steadfast love never failed. Were we wrong? And their conclusion was, no, we... We think we were not wrong. Look at, again, our history and how far God has brought us. And so out of this, again, ferment, you see this becomes a really significant period of, of reflection. You know, none of us likes crises and tension. But don't they often produce significance, you know, for us as we think and rethink and reconsider and maybe reshape our lives? Um, it's, it's never fun. But it can, it doesn't always, it can, you know, bring new fruit and new possibilities out. And, and out of this, they affirmed God is, in fact, the creator of all that exists. And creation belongs to God. And evil doesn't get it. God is still God. God is still at work. God's steadfast love never fails. And even now, even as Antiochus is doing, you know, his, you know, 
best or worst, to disrupt our hope, we affirm that God is still at work in the world and God is moving us even now, even as evil is raging. God is moving us to a place where God is going to do three primary things. God is going to judge those who do evil. Um, hold them accountable. In whatever form that takes, God will judge those who do evil. God will heal and forgive and vindicate the righteous ones. Those who remain steadfast are not abandoned by God. And then God will renew all of creation. Uh, not, just, not just us, human beings, but all of creation will be renewed in this work of God's. And this moment, this understanding that they had, they referred to variously as the age to come, the last days, the great and terrible day of the Lord, or, I bet you've heard this one, the kingdom of God. Okay? And so they held on then to this hope, and, and a couple of things were a party to this hope. One was that the renewal of all creation would mean that all people and all nations, you start looking through the prophetic text dealing with these, um, these hopes, and the language of all nations and all people is really strong. All nations and all people will stream to Zion to learn the ways of God together. And the people of creation will become children of God together. And those are the moments when, and you know these texts, when we beat our swords into plowshares and study war no more, that's when the wolf lies down with the lamb. Uh, the, the great hope for peace, or the wonderful Jewish word many of you will know, shalom, you know, which is more than just the absence of war, but it's a, this enormous sense of health and harmony and wholeness and peace in that sense. And that was a part of this great hope. And to have that come into reality, all nations and all people will be welcomed. We will be children of God together. Okay? That's part of the hope. And the other part of this hope was a hope for resurrection. Because what happens if you die before this moment is realized? What, too bad for you? <laughs> Born at the wrong time? You know? And particularly under Antiochus, if you remained faithful and suffered or were even killed for your faithfulness, and then you miss this moment, how could God be just? And we have said God is just. And so out of, again, this ferment grew this great hope for resurrection that not even death would separate us from the love of God, that not even death could take away our covenant with God. And so we would be resurrected in this moment. And by the way, those who've done evil, you don't get to die and go, you miss me. <laughs> you know, that's not happening. You will still be held accountable, resurrected to face God in that moment as well. And so resurrection is a part of this hope, again, for God's justice and God's love to prevail. And for God's life to permeate through all of us. And so here is the hope for resurrection that grew up within Judaism as a result of Antiochus' tyranny. I just always makes me laugh. I just think Antiochus, you know, thought he was, you know, being, you know, you know, the big bad boy in the world and the big kahuna, and look at all he's accomplished. And what he did was he fostered this great theological renewal within Israel. I bet it really ticked him off. <laughs> that was not what he intended to accomplish. So second century, you know, we're talking, you know, about the year 160-ish, you know, thereabouts in that second century before Jesus comes. This hope, you know, begins to flourish within Israel, okay? And so this is a part of the story, actually, of Jesus, because when Jesus is born into the world, and now, you know, we've moved, you know, by the time he's an adult, nearly 200 years forward, okay? And it's no longer Antiochus or the Syrians. Now, of course, it's Rome. But the oppression continues, and it's real, and it's difficult. And this great hope 
that had, you know, come into being under Antiochus has continued. You know, you, you don't wake up one day, you know, and, and, and out walks, you know, great teachers in Israel and says, okay, folks, now we believe this. You know, we didn't believe this yesterday, but today we believe this. And everybody goes, okay, got it. That, you know, that's not how it works. You know, you have the conversations and the teaching and the, and the, the long reflection on. And so in the years between Antiochus and then Jesus as an adult, this sort of reflection and, and, and stewing, if you will, and, and wondering about these things had continued. And by the time Jesus steps onto the scene and Rome's oppression and, and the suffering that Rome caused has become a very real deal, this conversation has been going on uh, for almost 200 years now. And, and people had begun to embrace this hope. Um, and so when Jesus steps into the world and announces, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Believe this good news. They would have heard that in this context of that conversation that's been going on for about 200 years. This growing, deepening sense of this hope that God is still at work in history to bring about that renewal that the prophets tell us about. By the way, if any of you would like to take a look, if, if you're those folks who want to go home and go, let me, let me look at that. Isaiah 24 through 27 is a really good place to look if you want to see an example of the, you know, a prophet talking about you know, these kinds of hopes. Now, y'all know how prophets talk. It's not going to be straightforward, right? It's going to be poetic and, you know, kind of run all over the place, but that's how prophets work, all right? But, but that's, a good, that's a good example and a good place to take a look, okay? So here comes Jesus announcing that the moment has drawn near. And it's always important to pay attention to his words. He doesn't say the kingdom of God will come. He says the kingdom of God has drawn near. It is happening. It's breaking out. Now, you know, you can say that, I can say that, anybody can say that, and the rest of us are going to go, okay, so what? And Jesus, of course, doesn't just say it. He sets out then and lives into it, or as one of my teachers once said, he lives as if it is true. So let's consider a few things that, uh, stories you'll likely know or many of you will likely know from his own life. He lived into his belief, his understanding, that the kingdom of God has drawn near. So, for example, he announced judgment on those who were doing evil. You know, the story that we often call the cleansing of the temple, if you all know the story, you know, he walks into the temple, which <clears throat> in the first century world, was not like Calvary Church and a, a place of worship. I mean, it was a place of worship, it just that wasn't all it was. This was a world where religion, economics, and politics could not be separated. No separation of church and state. That idea hadn't even been invented yet. So that the temple in Jerusalem in the first century was a place of worship and a symbol of God's presence with Israel, but it was also where the primary ruling authorities of the day, who were the chief priests, not just, by the way, religious leaders, but also the primary ruling authorities um, operating, they were, they were what sociologists today call the local ruling elites. I think you ought to throw that phrase around sometime in a conversation today, just so you can impress people with um, what you talk about at Calvary Church, you know, that stuff, right? Um, so they, they operate, I mean, clearly Rome is the big kahuna, but they cooperated. They, today we would say they collaborated with Rome to occupy those local ruling positions, and they were the chief priests. There was no capitalism either. And so they were, they controlled the economic resources. So the temple was the place out of which they operated. So I often tell folks that in the first century, the temple was the national cathedral, the IRS building, and the White House all at one time, okay? <laughs> you know, we don't like our politics today. Okay, well, <laughs> depends on what you're comparing it to, right? And so when Jesus goes into that temple, that fateful day, 
and starts just, as, as we say in the South, throwing a fit, right? That's what he's doing. You know, knocking over the tables and skewing the stuff and proclaiming at the top of his voice, my house should be a house of prayer for all nations. Look at that, for all nations. You have made it a den of robbers. Now, I don't know what you all think about what Jesus did that day. I don't know if you think he totally disrupted everything. He wouldn't have. The temple was a huge complex. So this was a spot in the temple. And, you know, 15, 20 minutes after he was gone, they had reset the tables and picked everything up, went right on the way it was. But this was what the ancient folks would have understood as a prophetic declaration of God's judgment on this system and the people who were running this system. We call it the cleansing of the temple. That's really not correct. This was like a cursing of the temple, as in, again, announcing judgment on it. Okay? So right after that, by the way, the chief priest started plotting to kill him, and that's why. Okay? That's how profound that was. Several days pass. Um, this is Holy Week in, in the Gospels telling of the story, and we get this moment. Uh, right toward the end of the week, um, Jesus is again in the temple. He's been teaching there all week and, and, and not gloating about the temple, I might add, as he does so. We have this text. It says, as Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Again, the announcing of judgment on those. These, remember, these are the folks who have collaborated with Rome to oppress their own people so they can keep their particular positions of power and privilege. Okay? So Jesus announces judgment on those who've done evil. He, and again, this is not a surprise to you at all, but he healed and vindicated and forgave the righteous ones. One of my favorite stories, some of you probably like this one as well, is the story of the paralyzed guy that they let through the roof, you know, to heal Jesus. In Mark's gospel, that's in chapter 2. I'm going to just read a portion of this. It's one of those um, things that uh, you have to have somebody nerdy like, I don't know me, um, to <laughs> because most of you all don't read Greek, and nerdy people like me, you know, read Greek, and so we can say, oh, this is cool, okay? So in that story of the, the, the guy being let through the roof, by the way, do you always, like, feel bad for whoever owned the house? <laughs> right. So I had a limb land on my house in the ice storm, you know, this past winter. That's not cheap, do you know that? <laughs> in case... You, in case most of you hopefully don't know that. So, I, so now I really love, you know, this story and chuckle at it, all right? So they, they tear a hole in the, in the roof and, and let the guy down on a pallet because they can't get in because all these people are sitting around Jesus uh, to listen to him teach. And here's what Jesus says uh, starting off. So verse 4, uh, And when they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. By the way, I just have, do you have this great image of that happening, you know? Like all these people in this house listening to Jesus, and, and somebody in there starts going. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> I, just, I, know, I mean, I just love to think about that, you know? And then finally they look up. And what do you, th you know, and it, you know, the roof is, something's happening. And you know what that guy, he elbows the person, you know, next, you know. Right? And the people across the room see him doing that, you know, and then they start looking. But I always think, what happens when the hand comes through the first time? <laughs> I, 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 I love to try to, you know, be there, right? And Hank, Hank go, you know, always uh, talk about going to stand in the dirt of the first century world, just hang out with these people and see, you know, how this played out. This is one of my favorites to do that. So while they're all going like this, they let the guy down. And in verse 5 it says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Here's the nerdy part of this that I'm delighted to tell you. In Greek, 
this verb, your sins are forgiven, is present tense. What is significant about that is that present tense in Greek denotes an action that is not only like contemporary, like happening now, but it's ongoing. So Jesus doesn't announce that the guy's sins are now forgiven. He's been living under God's forgiveness all along. But the interesting thing is, in that world, they wouldn't have known that. Their assumption, this man's deformity, this man's paralysis, would have been viewed as a sign of God's disfavor. As God's punishment, as God's cursing that guy. And that was wrong. And so Jesus announces that his sins are being already now forgiven. He lives under God's forgiveness. Long before Jesus tells him, stand up, take your mat and walk. And of course that creates a hullabaloo because who can forgive sins but God alone, right? And so the scribes who were sitting around, you know, get all been out of shape. They, they actually don't say anything out loud. And again, if you imagine them, can't you see, first of all, their eyes get this big? And then, you know, the looks they give each other. Did you hear that? Can you believe this guy? And I figure that at this point, they, they probably think, he's a nut. I don't have to worry about him anymore. He's a nut. And then what does Jesus do? He turns and says, so which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up, take your mat and walk? Which is easier, by the way? <laughs> yeah, to, to say your sin, because there's no like physical manifestation, right, of the, of the sins are forgiven. But in this culture, if he says, take your mat and walk, and the guy doesn't, everybody in that room's leaving. And of course, they don't leave because he tells the guy to get up and walk, and he does. And then, then can you see the faces of those scribes? Like, right? Another of the favorite stories to talk about the vindication of, are you kidding me? I guess, um, I'm out of time. i got to speed this up. <laughs> okay. um, the story of the woman with the hemorrhaging. You know the story? And she's not supposed to go out. In that world, she would have been declared unclean. Uh, she does come out. She takes matters into her own hands, comes out in the crowd, touches Jesus, not supposed to do that. You remember what Jesus says to her at the end of that story? He says, daughter... Family language, daughter, your sins are forgiven. You have made yourself well by bringing yourself into the presence of healing. So rather than condemning her, he heals and vindicates her and forgives her. Okay? So he announces judgment on those who do evil. He has vindicated, healed, and forgiven the righteous ones and he practices renewal by welcoming all nations and all people. You all know why Jesus got in so much trouble because he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Do you remember that? And you ever wonder why that just got, that was such a thing? And the reason is because in this world you didn't. You only ate with people like yourself. You only worked with people like yourself. You only spoke to people like yourself. You did not cross lines. Rome advocated for this, not advocated, Rome demanded, because it was in Rome's best interest to do divide and conquer. If all the people were involved in hating one another, then they didn't worry so much about Rome's rule. See how that works? And Jesus, of course, didn't play. He ate with tax collectors and sinners and women and anybody else who wanted a seat at the table. He fed multitudes we know the story of the feeding of the 5,000. That's on the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee. What we often don't know is there's a second feeding story, a feeding of the 4,000, which is on the Gentile side of the sea. So all nations, all people. So Jesus is living out. He doesn't just announce the kingdom has come near. He announced it. He lived into it. He practices renewal and sets out and invites people to join him. And disciples, of course, did join him. And clearly they heard something compelling in him. But they did not exactly get what he was doing. 
Uh, these disciples as an example. You remember James and John want to sit at his right and left hands when he comes in his glory. Remember that? You remember that they argued with one another over who was the greatest. You remember that? Jesus was thrilled. <laughs> Do you remember in Gethsemane? They had a sword and popped that thing out and started attacking Jesus' arresters. Remember that? What the Gospels show us is that the disciples could only imagine that God's kingdom in their lives would look like Rome's. And in that kind of world, the way you bring about change is to change the people at the top of the structure. So that's what they set out to do. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world works, they seemed to think. I say that they had uh, Roman imaginations. And what I mean by that is they imagined that the world was the way Rome had said it was. And again, then if you're going to bring about change, you've got to replace the people at the top. And so no matter what Jesus said, this is how they imagined the world. They heard something compelling in him, but they still imagined the world this way. Apparently for them, whatever renewal God had in mind in those great promises was out there in the future somewhere, but not part of life as they knew it. So they argued over who was the greatest, and they had a sword in Gethsemane. And have you ever noticed, that's when they flee. They stay with Jesus up to the moment when he will not fight, when he will not take up weapons, and that's when they run. That's when they're done. Because that's how they thought. So what changed for them? So all this is going on with Jesus and his disciples, and meanwhile, of course, those religious authorities I talked about a bit ago absolutely recognized that what Jesus was announcing was a threat to them. A threat without weapons. But a threat in the sense that he could get people to imagine their lives differently. Where they could do what God had called them to do and pretty much just ignore what Rome said. Now, they might suffer for that, but they could form new lives. And he was enabling people to imagine this possibility. And they couldn't have it. And so they said to him, if you don't stop, we will kill you. And, of course, he didn't stop. And so they killed him. Which should have stopped him. And it didn't. And it didn't because... His followers experienced him as resurrected. You know, this is the thing for me. They experienced him as resurrected. And you remember that I said earlier that resurrection was a part of that great hope. That God would act in history to judge those who do evil, vindicate the righteous ones, and renew all of creation. And resurrection was a part of that great hope. And so if Jesus was resurrected, so here, here's the way you do the syllogism. Those of you had philosophy courses somewhere along the way, right? So major premise, okay? Resurrection is a part of that apocalyptic hope of the coming of God's kingdom or the age to come. Minor premise, Jesus is resurrected. Therefore, the age to come has come. The kingdom of God is breaking out just exactly as Jesus said and lived, but they couldn't get it. They couldn't, they couldn't, there was something compelling about him, but they couldn't get it until they experienced him as resurrected. Whatever form that took, they experienced him as resurrected. And friends, that's the game changer. And what I say about them is they go from having Roman imaginations to having resurrection imaginations. If God can do this, then what else is possible? What renewal is possible for us? What can we live into? If this is possible, then what else is possible? I don't know if you know, but, and I'm working on my time, Paul. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but in the New Testament, 
one of the favorite ways for the New Testament writers to refer to God is as the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Or one of my favorite phrases in Paul's writings about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead. We are accustomed to thinking of God as creator and redeemer. How many hymns can you think of with that language? How much of our liturgy refers to as God as creator and redeemer? And God is, thanks be to God, I might add. But here's what the New Testament also says that we should include in our hymns and liturgies. And it's this. God is the resurrector. God is the God of life. Rome's fiercest weapon was, you stop or we will kill you. And God's life turns out to be greater than that. And in the wake of that, they had resurrection imaginations. So I started today talking about those two stories, and I said this is going to be the foundation. What I'm talking about is laying the foundation for responding to those two stories. So I hope you can see this foundation, God as the resurrector. And next week, we'll start specifically thinking about responding to those two stories, okay? All right, I have managed to save six minutes. Uh, so if anyone has, if I need to clarify anything, if anybody needs, uh, you know, to, me to say it again, or just want to ask a off-the-wall question for that matter, um, I'd, I'd be really willing to take that. So, uh, okay. okay. Do we have any questions from uh, Kate? And if you'll give me a moment to bring the mic to you. I'm just wondering if Jesus had stayed on earth longer after he was resurrected, would it have made a difference? You know, I, I, sadly, my guess is no. <laughs> and, and, and the reason that I say that is, boy, that's a really good question. I'm trying to think of a way to answer that in six minutes. <laughs> um, you know, I ask my students, you know, for example, I, I say this, and so let me, let me do it this way. If, if all they needed was to see Jesus as resurrected, then why didn't he just, like, appear to everybody in the world? I mean, if that's all it took, then why not appear to everybody in the world? And that, everybody's like, oh, wow, we're, oh, good, thank you. Okay, moving on, you know. And so clearly that wouldn't have worked, you know, or I think he'd have done that. So that there was an element of faith and receptivity. And that second word may be even more important than the first word. Um, reception of revelation, our willingness to receive revelation is enormously significant for our spiritual journeys. Because you all know this, we get in, in certain ways and understandings and lifestyles and we get very comfortable and frankly we don't want God to mess with them, right? And so the people in this world who were satisfied, who had places of power, privilege and whatever, they weren't interested in renewal. They wanted him to stop talking about renewal. And under those circumstances, my guess is they were not open to revelation. And if they're not open to revelation, him continuing to try to reveal, I think, wouldn't have made a big difference at all. So I hope that helps. That's my two, you know, three-minute answer instead of six. So I hope that helps. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, Scott. <laughs> okay, I, shouldn't the rector like be lots disqualified? Of <laughs> yeah, lots of them. He should be. I waited. I let pre pregnant pause there. Um, you know, my mother-in-law used to say, you know, he's of uh, he's so heavenly minded. He's of no earthly good. You know that old phrase. Um, I'm hearing this really dynamic relationship between a hope for resurrection and the present life. Absolutely. Is that? To, can you say something about that? I can, and I, and that's exactly the point. We have tended to make. In fact, um, I often say to my students, um, we tend to treat resurrection as if Jesus was dead, now he's alive again, aren't we glad? And they all lived happily ever after. 
<laughs> That's kind of how we, you know, and we, so we celebrate it every year during Easter, and then we're kind of done with it until the next Easter. And boy, have we missed what the New Testament is telling us. Because resurrection opens the possibility if, for God's renewal to break out in our midst. Um, and in all sorts of ways. And we're going to talk about some of those ways next week when I come back and address those things specifically. This, this gets to Zerla's question, if he is resurrected, what difference does it make? Um, so that it's not just something that we believe in, not for the writers of the New Testament. It opens up the possibility for renewal in our living now. That God's kingdom is breaking out in our midst if we are open and willing to receive that. But it means receiving renewal. And what happens if we kind of like the old? So we're back to how receptive are we to the revelation. So it is absolutely a dynamic hope for how we live now. Wendell Berry's fabulous phrase in the poem, um, The Mad Farmer's Manifesto, about practice resurrection. It's exactly what Jesus would tell us to do. So yes, we're, and we'll do, we'll talk about some of, some of what that looks like when we gather next week, okay? Yeah, yeah maybe, uh, Mr. go ahead, yeah. Let's. <laughs> I'm, oh, hello, live stream. <laughs> I'm intrigued with Nora Gallagher's, your opening question. If Nora Gallagher can, express her, I don't know if it's doubt or wonder or what. Um, it, it's comforting for those of us who have trouble. Right. But I'll be fascinated to hear you. And this is a commercial to please come next week. <laughs> uh, it, to hear your take on that. Yeah, the, the Nora Gallagher comment was, what I really want for Christmas is to believe in resurrection. So again, to Mimsy's point, if there are those of you sitting here or on the live stream who've often thought to yourself, I don't, know if I, can, I don't know if I can really go there, but because I go to church, I'm going to act like I believe this. <laughs> I mean, who among us hasn't done that at some point, right? I mean, if we're going to have this one of those honest moments. And that's one of the challenges there. And so, yes, I have very much appreciated her voicing what many folks have, you know, wondered, thought, asked about and we'll talk about that. I don't know that I can solve it, fix it, make it perfect, but we can talk about that in terms of the New Testament next week and absolutely are going to. So, yeah. So stay tuned for next week. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Mitzi. Yeah, thanks, Paul.